Hi, I'm Paul Resch. I uh, work in platforms, but when I'm not working, I do a lot of other things, including trying to see good theater. Um, I've been a subscriber with the San Jose Rep for many years. Um, and uh, last year, I joined the Board of Trustees there. Um, uh, as a result, I've had a chance to work with Rick um, for uh, more, more directly than I, I just did in terms of seeing his work there. Um, I actually got to work with him a little bit more. Um, uh, I can't tell you how actually valuable it is to be on the board and uh, recommend that for anybody who's interested. Um, in any case, uh, Rick's been with uh, San Jose Rep for about five years. Uh, I think this is your fifth season mm -hmm. and uh, has been directing a number of plays, including the currently uh, running uh, Disconnect. Rick Lombardo. Thank you. So I, I thought that I would uh, talk to you guys a little bit about what my journey has been um, to becoming an artist and why I'm an artist and why I think that um, theater arts in particular uh, are going to continue to prosper and thrive in this world that we live in, which is so digitally connected. Um, but where my belief comes from about, about that, about this, the sustainability of live theater, goes back to the roots of why I do it in the first place. So um, allow me a short story of my <laughs> of my path to being an artist and, and specifically a stage director. Um, when, I was, when I was young, and by what I mean by that is, you know, middle school years, early teen years, um, I was dabbling in all sorts of arts. I was, uh, I, had a, I put a dark room in my parents' basement. I um, was acting in uh, high school plays. I was getting all the kids in the neighborhood together and grabbing my dad's Super 8 movie camera and making science fiction movies of an invasion of our neighborhood. Um, I was playing in rock bands. I was doing all these things. There was clearly some creative spark that was involved, but I never thought or believed that my path was to be an artist. I came from a, a working class Italian American family in New York, and uh, I was second generation. and in my family and with all of my friends who were in like situations, um, you were either going, you were going to be some form of professional. You were going to be a doctor or you were going to be a lawyer. That was, that was what the path was supposed to be. Um, my grandparents had been immigrants. They never had a college education. So therefore, my dad had a college education and went into business. And therefore, I had to go to a graduate school and become a, take on a profession. And I just assumed that that was what was going to happen. So I was doing all these creative things. And at the same time, I applied to university. I got into a, a prestigious pre-med program. And, and that was it. I wasn't going to do anything creative any longer. Now I was going to begin my life's path. Um, and I stayed true to that for about um, two thirds of my freshman year in college. And then I got sucked back in, and I got asked to come if I would play drums in a band, and I started to do that again. And then the real thing that happened is that I saw that there was a notice um, for an original musical that was being produced by the undergraduate drama club. And I guess I had just gotten a little bored at that point with just doing my studies. I said, OK, I'm going to audition for this play, and I'll end my year doing this original musical. Um, and I did that. And of course, what happens with theater is that you create community, right? both with the people who are participating in creating it and then with the people who come to experience it. It creates community. Um, and as often happens with theater, I found myself plopped into a, into a new family right away. Um, for some reason, and I will never really know the reason for this, one of the graduating seniors in the drama club said to me, you know, we do this. Uh, we do this production every year for incoming freshmen during orientation week, and, and uh, it's usually something small. Would you, would you come back early from summer vacation and direct it? And to this day, I don't know why I was asked to do this, but I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. I mean, maybe, maybe they asked me because they thought I was the only sucker who would come back early from summer vacation. I'm not really sure why. Um, but I did, and I directed this play. And um, many artists speak about having a moment of epiphany. Epif epiphany can be when you're working on a project or you're, you're trying to tell a story and you get a, a sudden 
insight or strong intuition, you get an answer. Sometimes epiphanies literally are, are bigger answers, right? Moments where our life takes a new direction. And uh, for me, I feel like everything in my brain lit up when I started working on this. Everything that I had wanted, everything that I had been dabbling in, my love of literature, um, my love of thought, my love of storytelling, my love of making pictures, my love of using music. Um, as a stage director, it was about pulling all of these tools together and orchestrating all of these tools while also working with, with other human beings, while working with a, with, a, with a family of artists who create something. I had this wonderful experience, and then the next day, sophomore year started. And for me, the beginning of sophomore year was also day one of organic chemistry. Uh, second year of pre-med, Georgetown University, being taught by a very, very famous, internationally known biochemist. Um, and my walk, and I've already bought about you know two hundred and fifty dollars worth of books and lab books and lab materials, and and I, I sit down in the lecture room, and and this this uh, professor is talking to a room full of would-be practicing physicians. Um, he's a research biochemist. He wants to give the message that really people should go into research and not into practice. So he did the standard, you know, look to your left, look to your right. One of you will be a doctor. And, and then he said, and I just want you all to know that I believe that the only really viable career for a person of intellect is in the natural sciences. And I, I, I remember writing in my notebook, writing down that he had just said that. The only viable career for a person of intellect is in the natural sciences. And I looked at it after I wrote it, and I thought about it, and just thought, no. And I stood up, closed my books, and walked out of the lecture hall. Um, walked down to the registrar and changed my major. I did eventually finish with a psychology degree. Um, I realized that why I actually wanted to be a doctor was more that I was fascinated with, with human biology. Um, and for me, that fascination came down to um, what we are. What, what are we? What are we made out of? I was fascinated with that aspect of, of, of humanity. Um, when I took this moment, I took this right turn, and I decided, well, I'm going to get a theater minor, but I'm going to really, I'm going to finish my science degree, and I became a psychology major. Um, for me, the turn was about that my fascination was actually more than what we're made out of. My fascination was really more about how we are, how we behave, how we live, how our mind works, what it means to be human on not just a biological scale, but, but on, the, on the mental scale. Um, and I did finish with a, with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. Um, and of course, I learned a great deal about how the mind works and about how we behave. Um, but in the meantime, I kept doing lots and lots and lots of theater as an undergrad. I ended up directing 10 or 11 plays. Um, I ended up acting in maybe an equal number. And uh, as I was approaching graduation, I decided that uh, I didn't want to be a, a, some type of practicing psychologist or, or clinical psychologist or experimental psychologist, that I had now decided I really wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be a director. And the, the, now this new turn, which was to be an artist, for me when I look back on it was, I was no longer really interested in how we are. I was no longer interested in just um, how the mind works. Now I became really more interested in why we are. The sort of the basic, for me, the basic existential question. Why do we exist? What does it mean to be human and to have consciousness in this world that we live in? And this realm, right, the questions that are in this realm, for me, uh, are answered in, in, in three possible ways. Um, you can, religion attempts to answer this question. So you can choose a, a life of spirituality, which wasn't for me. Uh, philosophy 
asks this question constantly and addresses this question in every possible way that can be done with logic and thought. Um, for me, I found that too dry and uh, not as passionate and not as powerful as the third way, which is what I think artists do. I think that artists of every stripe, in whatever, whatever the medium happens to be, whether it's writing novels, whether it's painting, whether it's composing, whether whatever it is that one does, um, I think the artist is always nipping away at the fringes of the question of, of what does it mean to be human and why? Why? Why do we exist? What is this time that we have, this limited time that we have, what is it about? What are we to do with it? And, and what does it mean that we do these things together? Um, so I chose a life as, as an artist and have probably have spent the rest of my career um, never, an never coming to an answer to that question because I don't, I don't know that it's an answerable question. Um, but every play that I think that I've done, every story that I've ever told on a stage, uh, I know in some way frames this question in a slightly different context, in a slightly different world, in a slightly different um, cast of characters that are thrown into a situation. But when we sit in a darkened theater and we watch a story, we watch a story play out, I think that we're addressing and dealing with a very primal aspect of what it means to be human, which is a need to explore our lives and the meaning of our lives through story. I think story is a means that we understand our humanity. The, I think this happens on a, actually on a DNA level. Um, for me, there is a reason why when we go into the sleep state every evening, we must dream and we dream in story. It, it's another way that we process our day-to-day -day experiences, our tragedies, our hopes, our fears, our ideals, our, all of those things that make up our lives. We go into the dream state every day and we go into story state. In our waking lives, what I think story does is that story helps to define our identities. And I think this is a very, very ancient part of being humans. I, um, I like to believe, and I think, I'm, I think I'm writing this, that probably the very first artistic act that ever took place in our evolution as a species was probably a moment when some early, early human, part of some early tribe, um, at night, around a fire, stood up and told some kind of story. Now, maybe that story was about a creation myth. Maybe that story was about last the flood 10 years previous that changed the tribe. Maybe that story was about the great hunt. Maybe that story, maybe that, that story, whatever it was about, was a moment where folks sitting in a circle shared something that started to create for them an identity. And I think that as humans, we create our identities through our stories. There were actually nothing without those stories. If, you know, if I were to ask you, um, how, do you, how do you define your family? What you would start to do is tell me stories about your family. And we have fabulous stories. If I asked you, what do you think it means to be American? What about a national identity or a cultural identity? We create that through our stories, whether it's the, whether it's the founding of the country and the revolution or the founding fathers or, 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 whatever our individual points of view are about national identity, 
is based on stories and our interpretation of those stories. History is a series of stories. Our personal identity, how each one of us defines ourselves, is based on the stories of our lives. So for me, telling stories is not something that one does for entertainment. For me, telling stories is a fundamental act of being human. And, and theater is a vehicle. Theater is a, is a, is a, is a model of, that we have created for a way to tell stories. Now, there are lots of ways that we tell stories these days. Movies do an incredibly wonderful job telling stories. Completely different type of medium. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Television tells stories. It borrows almost all the techniques from film, from cinema. Novels do an incredible job telling stories. Theater does its job telling stories. I don't think anyone is stronger or better than the others because they each work on us in completely different ways. When we read the novel, we enter the world of that story. We control the pace. We read the novel at our own rate. We read it all at once. We read it in bits and pieces. We go back and we reread sections. We develop relationships. We create in our mind's eye what the world of the novel looks like, what those characters look like, what they sound like, because we are completely left to use our imagination. Cinema is the complete opposite of the novel. Cinema is primarily a storytelling medium that tells a story through picture and powerful image and some dialogue, but more, more skewed to powerful image and picture than to dialogue. The difference, of course, between cinema and the novel is that cinema is immutable. In fact, it doesn't ask us to bring our imagination into it at all. Cinema is a much more passive experience. However powerful it is, and it's very powerful, it doesn't ask us to engage in the imaginative way that the novel does. The novel asks us to work. Cinema asks us to receive these powerful images, usually on a massive screen. So. I, I often think about the difference in movies, and I'm, I'm going to talk a minute about theater, by the way people sit in those seats. Because they're the same seats. In a sense, they're the same darkened room, right? But in a really good movie, you still are probably sitting back and just letting the experience and the sensations take you over, right? You want it to transport you. When we go to see Avatar, we want to be taken somewhere. When we go to see Gone with the Wind, we want to be taken somewhere. When we go to great theater, and when I watch audiences, and I, this is what I do professionally, I watch audiences watch plays. When I watch an audience watch a really great piece of theater, no one is sitting back. Usually, people are sitting forward. Because theater drops into that spot between the novel, for me, it drops into that spot between the novel and cinema, where we see what the characters look like because they're inhabited by the actors. We hear how the characters speak and sound because they're inhabited by the actors. But theater still requires us to engage our imagination. And some of the greatest modern theater asks us to engage our imagination quite a lot. Sometimes it takes place on bare stages. And it's just great words and great actors asking us to fill in the picture. This goes back to Shakespeare's theater. When an actor walked on the stage at the Globe Theater in London, there was no scenery. The stage looked pretty much the same for everything. Maybe a chair, maybe a thing, maybe an extra curtain. But you were at the Globe Theater. So in As You Like It, a character walks on stage and says, this is the forest of Arden. There's no trees. There's no leaves. There's none of our high-tech lighting that allows us to see, oh, it looks like it could be lighting through a forest. It's daylight in the Globe Theater. The character says, this is the forest of Arden. Shakespeare 
gives the characters incredible poetic imagery to speak, poetry that contains enormous visual pictures. And then we engage our imagination and we see the world. Theater still works the same way that it worked for Shakespeare. It still works the same way it worked for Aeschylus and Sophocles in the Greek theater. And it probably still works in the same way it did when that, when that early tribal or cave dweller stood up and started telling a story. It's really not very different. So I think of it with what I do and what theater artists do is actually being connected to a very, very, very long thread with a very, very, very ancient art form of storyteller and story, which is really all theater ever needs. Um, a very, very influential modern director who, who I respect a great deal was Peter Brook. And um, I don't know if you, did you ever read Peter's book, uh, The Empty Space, while you were studying? Um, he wrote a book called The Empty Space that was incredibly influential in the 1960s. Um, and, and one chapter starts off with the question, why a chair? And the, the question meaning, uh, why a chair on a stage? Or why anything on the stage? That anything that's there should be there to help tell the story. But you really don't need anything to create an act of theater. An act of theater could be created right now. I could start telling you a story, and it would be, we would, there we go, and we're off. It's theater. A story with a point, a story with dramatic tension, a story, a story that in some ways takes the listener on a journey, which ultimately is, is what the storytelling of theater is meant to do. When, when theater works best, a story begins on stage or wherever in a circle, and it allows the audience the listeners and the viewers to begin to imagine themselves walking in the shoes of those characters. That's, that moment of transfer, transference for me is the moment of engagement with the play. That's what theater does. We begin to walk through the play with Hamlet. What would I do at this moment? Would I make that choice? And when we, when we create that connection of empathy and we begin to walk in Hamlet's shoes, I think we're doing a very similar thing to what we do in the dream state. Because as we confront the choices that that character makes, we're confronting the choices of our own lives without realizing it. But that's what the moment of engagement with the art does for us. It's why we crave it. It's the most powerful form of entertainment because we're living and breathing through the story. Where it's different from cinema, cinema does these incredible pictures that I wish I could do, but I can't. There's no way that live theater yet can match that level of technology and close up. And just can't do it. Can't do close ups. Can't do that level of intimacy. Yeah, we do, you know. So we can do a spot, we can do a spotlight, big deal. Um, so, so the things that cinema could do, we can't do. What theater can do, that cinema can't do, is the fact that whether the audience realizes it or not, theater is a much more dangerous act of art. Because the movie is never going to change. No matter what we do as audience, if we laugh, if we cry, if we gasp, if we stand up and shout, if we start screaming at the stage in protest, the movie's just going to keep, keep, keep spooling. It's not dangerous that way. In the live event, there is an inherent element of danger that makes it different. At any moment, something new can happen. And whether the audience knows it or not, I think they understand it on an intuitive level. I understand it on, on the literal level, is that their participation and their presence 
changes the event, that they're actually a co-creator. I think this is one of the lasting aspects of theater as an art form that will, that will maintain its relevance. Theater has always been an adopter of new technology. So new, new stage technologies come along, theater just absorbs it. New electric and electronic technology comes along, theater absorbs it. We're getting new digital technology now, theater absorbs it. We, they just become tools to throw in the toolbox to telling a story. Theater will become very high tech. It's pretty high tech today. It'll become even more high tech. It will remain theater as long as there is the as long as there is a live element and as long as there is an element of danger. That the live actor will fall off the tightrope. That element of danger is what separates any live act of performing arts. And I think that that will never go away. I'm, I'm intrigued by um, what's been happening with music, for example. Um, these days, not only is recorded music, um, but not only does it sound spectacular, it's also, for the most part, free. You don't have to buy it anymore, really, right? You can get live music, you can get recorded music anywhere you want it, anytime, pretty much for free. Yet, live concert sales are higher now than they've been in recent memory. So what is it that's still, the sound is inferior, doesn't, doesn't, never sounds as good. The venues are kind of shoddy. I mean, the, what is it, however, that makes someone want to go in a 14,000-seat arena uh, 150 feet away from the performer for their music experience? And why will they pay $100 for the privilege? I believe it's that element of danger that remains part of, the, of live performing arts. Also, that element of being part of a communal experience and being in community. I think that we, again, I'm going back, I go back to DNA a lot. Um, I think part of the DNA of the human animal is to be tribal, is to be communal. Um, for some people, that means going to church every Sunday or going to synagogue every Saturday or whatever it is that they do, is that they come together in community. For some people, it's found uh, through politics. For some people, it's found only through family. For some people, it's found through music. Some people, it's found through sports. I mean, let's face it. I'm a Boston Red Sox fan, and I know people who go to 65 games a year. That's where they would rather spend 65 summer nights than anywhere else, was being in that tribe with that communal experience. That's quite dramatic, by the way. That's a story with a beginning, middle, and end every night. <laughs> a very definitive story. People crave stories. That's why they love sports. They love sports because they love stories. The stories of the players, the stories of the teams. The it's all about stories. But that needing to come together as organisms, as organic beings, in a space, what theater asks us to do is, is come into a room with a room full of strangers, sit in a chair in the dark next to a stranger, and then open our hearts and open our minds together. And over the course of the evening, if it's a really good production, if it's a great tragedy, if it's a great comedy, we begin to laugh as a community or we will grieve as a community when Lear comes out and sees carrying his dead daughter Cordelia in his arms. We will grieve as a community with him. And there's something that happens in that room after doing it hundreds of nights a year for almost 30 years now. I know that there is something that happens in that room 
when you combine all of those human energies. We're just, we're just energy, right? We're just beings of energy. That's all we are. When you bring all of our energies together in a space with the energy of the artists and a powerful and compelling story takes place, there is some type of transformation that we are hungry for and that we need. And that I think is what theater, uh, which will sustain theater as we continue to, to move forward into incredible new realms of tools and technologies. I don't know what they're going to be, um, but we're going to use all of them. We're going to use 3D holographic actors alongside living, breathing actors. We're going to do all of that stuff, all that stuff that, that folks in this building and others like it in the Valley are going to be creating. We're going to use all of it. But there's still going to be this ancient thread, I think. It has to be dangerous. It has to be alive. We have to come together to do it. Those three things will make a theater. So um, I want to say a little bit about uh, the rep then. Um, have you guys been to the rep before? Have you been to San Jose rep? Well, so uh, we're, in, we're in the middle of downtown San Jose. Um, we're uh, the flagship regional theater for San Jose um, and for the Valley. Uh, we have a 500 seat theater, uh, state of the art, built in the mid 90s. Um, we do seven shows a year. And we try to lean towards contemporary work, uh, a couple of world premieres a season, uh, interesting new plays. And we, uh, we look for actors from around the country. So, for example, the play we have right now on our stage, half the actors are from LA, half are from New York. Uh, we try to bring in the best artists from, from both our region and then from around the country to, to work with us. Um, the theater is 32 years old now. Like Paul said, I've been there five years. The previous artistic, artistic director had been there 22 years, a long, long tenure. Um, and, uh, and I hope that at some point you guys will, will come in and check out what we're doing. Um, I'd be, I'd, we should take some questions, right? Sure. If you get, yeah. So you talked a lot about storytelling. Like I could have just told you why I think art's important, but I think by telling you a story of how I got there, it's, a, you, it's clearer, right? And it means more. Um, I think the challenge is, is that it has to be something that starts in the early years in school. And unfortunately, we live in an era right now where the things that teach storytelling which is uh, literature, studying, studying, studying more literature, um, writing classes, art classes. Um, these are the things that we're not putting much value on in early education anymore. Um, we, have a, we, have a, you know, we have this great um, impetus right now on science and math, science and math, science and math, which is good. I studied science and math, um, but I was very lucky that while I was studying science and math, I also had great teachers in literature and English and the humanities and history. History tells us the great stories too, but I don't think we study history enough these days. Um, we don't learn enough about how we've arrived at where we are. I think, I think unfortunately, American culture is very much of, about the moment. It's about this moment and the next moment, very rarely about the past moments. And we learn so much from the stories of the past. So how to teach people to tell stories, I, I, I think it's about exposure at a very early age. How you take an adult who has never studied the humanities and literature, I, I, I think it would be a journey of, of starting to recommend some great novels, starting to recommend some great movies, starting to recommend some great theatrical experiences, and then asking people to talk about it. Because um, we've also, I think, unfortunately, lost some of our ability to, to talk. Um, and that's where storytelling, storytelling is an oral tradition. Um, something is happening, right, in, in our culture, and I don't know that any of us know what the end result of it is going to be. Um, but I saw, I saw it happen in my own family, um, where I, I have two stepsons and a, and a, and a young daughter. And uh, my stepsons range in age from 32 to 27, 
to our daughter is 16. And just in the course of that lifetime, I have seen um, with a 32-year-old, um, very verbal, being on the phone with friends, talking, face-to-face -face talking. 27-year-old, um, through high school, telephone, no, telephone's gone. Um, uh, AOL chat rooms, getting into a chat room together with a bunch of friends and just everybody there and just chatting while typing, to now, it's with my daughter, it's almost completely text relationships, right? Texting relationships. Uh, very little, much less face-to-face, -face, absolutely no phone time, all texting. Um, I'm not saying anything is good or bad, but I've seen this happen culturally in my own family. And I wonder what that means, because I think there's a fundamental change happening in the way human beings are, are going to be interacting. Um, I make no assumptions over what's good or bad, but I know it's happening. So I think we have to figure out what it means for the future. You have to edit that part out, because my, my daughter can't see that. <laughs> I think that uh, theaters are slow to evolve as organizations. Artists are not slow to evolve. Um, any individual production can, you know, can change on a dime. But organizations and theaters, the regional theater movement in the country has become about organizations. Organizations evolve more slowly. Um, and I would say for the last, this is the, in the last decade, I've run two different theaters, and I've seen it at both institutions. The grasping at straws to figure out how to use the new technologies that exist in order to better engage and interact with the audience. Um, so yeah, do we have a YouTube channel? Yes. Do we try to do video teasers and interviews with actors and put them there and on our website, yes. Do we um, gather email addresses and create email newsletters with video content, yes. Do we have a Twitter feed, yes. Do we tell people what the hashtag is for a show so they can engage in conversation, yes. Do we have a Facebook fan page, sure. Do we try to post there so that people see interesting comments and content they want to comment, yeah. We, you know, but. Is there any great expertise at that, at the nonprofit level compared to what else is happening in other parts of the valley? Probably not. Um, you know, arts, nonprofit arts organizations, by their nature, are under resourced, underfunded, um, and you know, traditional theater marketing, which was about buying an ad in a newspaper and and waiting for a review and all of those things clearly are things of the past, but a huge chunk of the audience still gets their information that way, while there's this other part of the audience that wants to engage in an entirely different way. And uh, we learn in fits and starts about how to do it. I am desperately wanting to find ways to use all of those technologies to create a much deeper artistic experience for the audience that's going to see something. You know, we, we try to find ways that the pre-show experience and the post-show experience um, through technology can enrich the whole thing. Um, so it's constantly about experimentation and exploration and seeing what, what actually works for the theater audience, um, which, which remains a challenge, I think. Yeah, the, the, the sad thing. Um, remains that live theater is very resource intensive, right? It's extremely expensive because there's a lot of human capital involved. Actors, designers, directors, stage managers, stage crew, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of people involved. It's incredibly expensive. And our nonprofit theaters, unfortunately, are not as philanthropically supported by the community as much as I would like to see them supported. So it puts those of us who run these theaters in the rather unhappy position of having ticket prices that I believe create a barrier to some people um, in our community. And I'm very unhappy about that. Um, 
So we do things to try to mitigate that. For, ex for example, we, the first preview of each of our shows, we now do what we call a pay-what-you-will performance, where if you want to pay five bucks or ten bucks, you can get in to see the play um, at that performance. No reserved seating, and usually we'll get you know, 300 people or, or so who will avail themselves of that. And they're usually um, older on fixed incomes, younger college students or just out of college students, maybe still trying to um, get a job or they have their first startup job. Um, and some people who've never been to the theater before, who are just people who look for uh, cheap entertainment or cultural options. So that's one way that we could lower that barrier. But the so theater in America has become, I hate to say this, but I think that the, the, the problem is that it can be perceived as being for the elite, um, when I don't think it should be at all. I think theater is the most populist art form that there is. It's not like going to the symphony. It doesn't, doesn't have to be stuffy. It's not a stuffy experience. Theater should be a rowdy, populist experience. Um, very often that's driven by the programming. When we did uh, Spring Awakening last year, um, I saw many more young people. I saw a you know, much broader spectrum of the community was there for that. Um, for some of the more standard or traditional plays that we might do, or just even modern plays that folks don't know, it tends to skew older, um, certainly. And it tends to skew more affluent. And that's a huge challenge, um, because I don't want to be running a cultural organization that's just for a certain uh, class or demographic of people, because they have their own value system. Um, I don't want to run a theater that's, that's just dominated by one particular value system in the audience. The, the, theater, the theater audience should reflect the community that we live in. So that's something we're, we have to constantly work on, and to keep ticket prices low enough so that that's possible. Yeah. Um, the first is, is that there is a segment of our audience. I don't, I don't actually believe that, that they drive the artistic decisions that I make, but certainly there's a segment of the audience that likes big sets and likes a lot of costumes. They like that. They like that. Um, but that, that doesn't, frankly, doesn't drive artistic decisions. Um, the artists do. And as the artistic director, I pick the plays, I pick the artists, and I curate the season. But I don't tell all the artists, this is exactly the way I want you to do your shows. I'm, you know, I'm directing a play that's different. But if I have a guest director, so when I, I want to give the directors and the designers the resources that they believe they need to tell that story in the most powerful manner. Sometimes those directors and designers will say, you know, to tell this story in the most powerful manner, I think we need no scenery. They rarely say that. <laughs> they, they, more often than not, they'll come to me and they say, this is the way we want to tell this story, and there's like enormous moving scenery and millions of costumes, and then I have to say, whoa, 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 let's, because we don't even have that kind of budget, so let's, we, have to, we have to figure out a way to, to cut that down. Um, So it, there's, there's, there could be an economic tension with those kind of artistic decisions. But I, but I believe that my job is to try to provide as many resources as I can to, to those artists to, to do the work in the way that they feel, I really do need this to most effectively tell the story to the audience. And sometimes it takes stuff. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.